This video will cover the phenotype of proto-Semites from a young earth perspective. But before we get too deep into the video, first I want to tell you guys about my social media platforms. So I have a Clubhouse account and we can actually talk to one another on it. I also host Clubhouse Rooms every now and then where I might talk about history and genetics of the Middle East and Africa. I have a Twitter page, a Facebook account, and a Facebook page, as well as a Instagram, all titled The Hebrew of Israel. And what I typically do on these platforms is post upcoming videos as well as um, slides for my presentations. And so just be on the lookout for all of that on my social media platforms. And if you want to support me financially for the channel, you can look at my Patreon as well as my PayPal and my GoFundMe. And with all of that out of the way, let's begin with the video. First of all, we know according to the genealogy that Abraham is a descendant of Shem. Genesis chapter 11, verse 10 through 26. This is the genealogy of Shem. Shem was 100 years old and begot Orphaxad two years after the flood. After he, after he begot Orphaxad, Shem lived 500 years and begot sons and daughters. And then from verse 10 to 26, it says, Orphaxad, Shelah, Eber, Peleg, Ru, Serg, Nahor, now Terah lived 70 years and begot Abram. And as you can see on the right hand side of your screen is a simple genealogy without the verses but a straight line. Interestingly enough, a paternal lineage and of course a map showing and displaying Semitic languages. So we will be taking a young earth approach when it comes to the phenotype of Semites starting from Shem to Abraham. With that being said, let's begin. One of the first approaches we can use when determining the phenotype of Shem and his descendants is by looking at the writings uh, that focus on the phenotypes and look of Shem's descendants. Luckily, we have writings from Hebrews or Jews Arabs, Muslims, Christians, Persians, and many others that tell us the phenotype of Shem and his progeny. So the first one is the Pekar, the Pekri A de Rabbi Eleazar from the 8th century who says, He blessed, he being the Most High, blessed, blessed Shem and his sons, black but calmly, and he gave them the inhabitable earth. So Shem is blessed black but calmly, black but beautiful, and he gave them the inhabitable earth. And this is from uh, Al Tebri, History of the Messengers and the Kings. Uh, this is a Muslim source, and it says, The children of Sam, Shem, settled in the center of the earth, which is between Sadraman and the sea, and between Yemen and Syria. Allah made the prophets from them, revealed the books to them, made them beautiful, gave them a black complexion, luminous, and free of blemish. So this source says that the descendants of Shem are, uh, uh, again, black and beautiful, black and common. And this is from the Persian historian Tebri, born to Shem, bo excuse me, born to Noah, were Shem, whose descendants' colors are a black complexion with a light brownish undertone and a dark blackish brown. So from this source, we get basically three different skin tone types. We have a black complexion for Shem's descendants, a light brownish complexion, as well as a dark blackish brown. So that's very interesting. And of course, I have to the right hand side of the screen pictures of uh, indigenous skin tone maps that kind of can reflect that actually. And this is from Ibn Abbas, a famous Arabic scholar who says, Allah made the descendants of Sam or Shem 
and the descendants of Ham, black skin. So from this source, it's basically showing that both the descendants of Shem and Ham, they have similar complexions. They're both black skin. They both uh, seem to look the same. And this is from the 13th century historian Aben al-Abri, or bar uh, Habrakius, who says, Shem, the land of the browns. And so he is saying that, you know, Shem has brown-skinned people. As we can see, according to Hebrews, Arabs, Muslims, Christians, Persians, etc., many of them say Shem's descendants were dark-skinned, specifically ranging from light brown to medium brown to even black-skinned. This is very fascinating because this gives us an idea from an ancient perspective how Shem's descendants could have looked. This means the people from Shem to Abraham could have been dark-skinned, somewhere between light brown to black in complexion. So now let's look at the Natufians. Now, when it comes to the biology of Natufians, we know that it is believed that Natufians are the ancestors of Semites. From a younger perspective, I believe that they are the descendants of Shem. Natufians would represent the early descendants of Shem. Therefore, Natufians are a great source to look at when determining the ancient phenotype for Semites, beginning with Shem to Abraham, or Eber to Abraham. This is from In Hot Pursuit of Language and Prehistory, and it says, This paper makes an additional inference, since there is archaeological and physical anthropological reason to believe that the Natufians were related to modern Semitic-speaking peoples of the Levant, that would include your Israelites. And so here is the area of Natufian culture, basically beginning from the Negev near Sinai all the way up to Syria and northern Mesopotamia. And as you can see on the right hand side of your screen is a reconstruction, a forensic reconstruction of a Natufian. And so this is from the New York Times, a paper that came out in 1857 dealing with the Natufians. And it says, they were clearly a Negroid people, said Sir Arthur, with wide faces, flat noses, and long, large heads. They may have been ancestors or ancestors of the Arabs or Semites of biblical times, in Sir Arthur Keith's opinion. That's very interesting because this is following along with the Israelites descending from Natufians. And it says, in addition to these riddles, Sir Arthur Keith propounded another linking them unaccountably to ancient Ur of the Chaldees and the prehistoric man of South Africa. But a strange coincidence, he said, at the time of the burnt remains came to me, Lenord Woodley, sent me a box of human remains from under the foundation of Ur. These burnt bones from Ur of about the third dynasty also represent not, ordinar not ordinarily cremation, cremation of dead bodies clothed with fresh but cremation of dry bones in the remains of in the remains from Ur's women's bones were preponderated. And this is interesting because we know that Abraham comes from Ur of the Chaldees. Genesis chapter 11, verse 31 through 32. And Terah took his son Abram and his grandson Lot, the son of Haran, and his, and his daughter-in-law Sarah, his son Abram's wife. And they went out with them from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan. And they came to Haran and dwelt there. So in the days of Terah were two hundred and five years, and Terah died in Haran. So it's interesting how these Natufian remains seem to be linked to Ur of the Chaldees, and even, you know, prehistoric man in South Africa. So it's very interesting. So following along with the Natufian phenotype, it says several features stand out quite, quite definitely. They were a long-headed people a uh, pre-dynastic Egyptian in type. Thirdly, their faces were short and wide. Fourthly, they were prog prognathous, 
with protruding jaws. Fifthly, their nasal bones were narrow and high, but formed a wide, low arch. Basically, they had wide noses. But, and this again is Keith, uh, 1931, but with a distinct bias towards the African variety of that stock represented by the pre-dynastic people of Egypt. So Natufians seem to have looked a bit pre-dynastic. And it says, a Natufian skull pictured in Brett Contian, 2003, exhibiting many features consistent with recent African ancestry. So it seems like Natufians have, uh, their skull seems to represent some type of African influence. And that's a Natufian skull, of, as you can see, a very long skull, as they said, they're long-headed people. And it says, descriptions of Natufian and PPN, pre-pottery -pre Neolithic remains, consistently report post-bregmetric um, depression, among other features, consistent with sub-Saharan African ancestry. So it's very interesting. Over and over again, Natufians, as well as pre-pottery Neolithic remains, seem to look sub-Saharan African in appearance. And this source dealing with the uh, the nasal cavity of Natufians says, uh, has led me to the conclusion that all represent the same racial stock. Remarkable was the nasal development of this cave people, often almost Negro-like in the flattening of the nasal bridge and in the width of the inter interorbital uh, septum, such as might herald the pronounced nasal development of later Semitic races. So it's believed that this Negro-like nose of the Natufians could have represented or helped form the quote-unquote Semitic uh, nasal development of, uh, of Semites, which is interesting. So this, uh, uh, this uh, paper right here actually deals with the Natufian phenotype as well. The questionable contribution of the Neolith Neolithic and the Bronze Age to European craniofacial form. And so it says, It is a further surprise that the Epipaleolithic Natufian of Israel, from whom the Neolithic realm was assumed to arise, has a clear link to Sub-Saharan Africa. Interestingly enough, however, the small Natufian sample falls between the Niger-Congo group and the other samples used. This placement suggests that there may have been a sub-Saharan African element in the makeup of the Natufians. As shown in Figure 1, the Somalis and the Egyptian Bronze Age sample from Nequada may also give a hint of a sub-Saharan African component. So as we can see on this chart, Niger Congo and Natufian are very close to one another. And on this chart, Natufian is in between Niger Congo and prehistoric slash recent Northeast African. So in conclusion, if the late Pleistocene Natufian sample from Israel is the source from which that Neolithic spread was derived, then there was clearly a sub-Saharan African element present of almost equal importance as the late prehistoric Eurasian elements. So Natufian's phenotypically look very sub-Saharan African. And I think Common is a very good example of what a Natufian would look like in the flesh. Just looking at Common's features and the Natufian's features, such as the nose, the cheekbones, the lips, the forehead, the eyes, it all seems to, and the shape of the head, they all seem, it, both seem to look very uh, similar. So phenotypically, Natufians basically looked African or Negroid. This means Abraham's ancestors, proto-Semites or pre-proto-Semites, uh, could have looked something like that. Uh, they could have had somewhat of an African look to them. Perhaps even Abraham, depending on how homogenous his ancestry is. There are various descriptions of proto-Semitic remains from ancient Semitic civilizations. There is another good, this is another good avenue in determining the phenotype for the Semites from Shem to Abraham, from another uh, biological point of view, but closer to the time period of the biblical era. So let's look at the description of proto-Semites. 
So this is from Archaeology and the Sumerian Problem. Uh, and it deals with the Al-Umbud remains. And it says the people resemble for the the people responsible for the Al-Umbud stage of culture belonged to judge by their dis their distribution to the Middle Eastern section of the Mediterranean race, to the brown race of Professor Elliot Smith, in fact, but of their language we can say nothing. As to the characteristics of the dolicocephalic population of Mesopotamia, Dr. Brexton distinguishes a brown Mediterranean and a brown Eurafrican type. They are in fact often included together in the term Mediterranean, but as distinguished by Dr. Brinkston, the brown Mediterranean, Mediterranean variety seems later and related with the West, whereas the Eurafrican type seems more ancient and has connections with the East. Brown Eurafrican variety of the dolicocephalic population at Kish and other variety, the brown Eurafrican type, the brown Mediterranean type, which is related with the West, can hardly be anything but Semitic, for it is certain that we have to account for Mediterranean Semites from Arabia at an early date in Mesopotamia. So here is a Hayden, as they mentioned in the previous source, when it comes to the Eurafrican type. He says that the skin is dark, uh, complected, uh, the hair is dark, the eyes is dark, the head is very long, the nose often broad and prognathinous, uh, it's very uh, slight, often slight. So the nose is often broad and the pronathinism is, is often uh, slight. And again, when it comes to these Umbud remains and these Kish remains, they're saying that they're brown, you're African, brown, Mediterranean, and that Semites fall into this category according to this source and I just read in the source when it comes to the your African mentioned by Hayden from the other source and uh, it's very interesting what we're starting to see here so they said that the skull is long and long skulls are typically uh, quoted as being dolicocephalic as they said and it's typically represented under the negroid category also pronathanism is often considered negroid because it's the protruding of the jaw and the nasal cavity being wide a wide nose is again often associated with negroid especially when you combine all three long skull pronathinate jaw wide nose it's, it's typically represented of the negroid type so sir uh, sergey uh, argued that the mediterranean race had in fact originated in africa probably in the sahara region and that it also included a number of dark-skinned peoples from the African continent, such as Ethiopians and Somalis. Sergi also asserted that the Semites were a branch of the Eurafricans who were closely related to the Mediterraneans. So again, another source talking about how Semites are connected to these Eurafrican, these brown Eurafrican, these brown Mediterranean peoples of ancient times. And so this book is called The Passing of the Great Race when it comes to the Mediterranean race. And so reading the source, it says the Mediterranean race was first defined by Sergi, who calls it Eurafrican. The Mediterranean race originated in Africa and is closely related to the Negro, both being long skull peoples descended from a common stock, the Eurafrican. And so that's very interesting because we know Sergi also sees Semites or ancient Semites connected with these peoples. And so here is a source dealing with the reports on the human remains found at Kish. And Kish is an ancient Semitic civilization. I'll get into that in a minute. But it says this report on the human remains found at Kish by the Field Museum and Oxford Expedition is based on the material excavated in the old Sumerian palace at eastern Kish. All remains from the palace, or in our terminology, Mount A, belong to the period in immediately preceding the age of Sargon of Agad, and are contemporary with the last fourth dynasty of Kish, circa 
2900 through 2800 BC. The names of the eight rulers of this period indicate clearly a Semitic dynasty. So when we're dealing with these Kish remains, we're dealing with Semites. I want to make that clear. The population at Kish in the period to which the human remains of the palace belong should be, therefore, very mixed. Brixton finds two long-headed races in the palace, in the palace skulls at Kish, which he designates as Ur-African and Mediterranean. And we just read about what a Ur-African and a Mediterranean is. So let's quickly look at the Kish really quick so we can understand that it, it is a Semitic ancient Semitic civilization. So Kish, the Kish civilization, is a time period uh, corresponding to the early East Semitic era in Mesopotamia and the Levant. Coined by Igris Gelb, the epoch began in the early 4th millennium BC. The tradition encompasses the sites of Ebla and Mari in the Levant, the Proto-Akkadian sites of, Ab of Abu Salahi and Kish in central Mesopotamia, which constituted the Ur region as it was known to the Sumerians. The East Semitic population migrated from what is now the Levant and spread into Mesopotamia. And this is what I believe when it comes to the ancestors of Abraham coming from the Levant to Mesopotamia. And of course, when it comes to, to Natufians, they also come from the Levant and their descendants would have migrated to Mesopotamia. So this is very interesting that everything is falling along beautifully. Now, continuing what it says, the Sumerian city of Kish shows an East Semitic nature and reveals that the city population had a strong Semitic component from the dawn of recorded history. Gleb considers Kish to be the center of this civilization, hence the name. So now let's look at the East Semitic languages, which are all extinct, by the way. The East Semitic languages are one of the three divisions of the Semitic languages. The East Semitic group is attested by three distinct languages, Akkadian, Ebalite, and Kishite, all of which have been long extinct. Kishite language is the oldest known Semitic language. Very interesting. So, let's look at these people who have the oldest known Semitic language. What are their remains? So, a considerable development of the temporal muscle and is found typically in such skulls as those of the Australian type. So basically they're saying that they do see something about the skulls that look uh, somewhat uh, uh, Australian Aboriginal. So continuing what the paper is saying, the Combell Capel skull are well known and with and will give a clear idea of the appearance of the Kish type A. The forehead was retreating, and the brow ridges were always prominent. The cheekbones were rather broad, and the nose also was broad. In some cases, inclining to extreme Pratsrayan. There can be little doubt that this type is that which has been described by Sergi, uh, Grafdari Reguri, and from and from and uh, and the name and that named the Eurafrican type. So, by the way, when it comes to Pritchrayum, that is referring to uh, the nose, as I went over earlier. Pritchrayum meaning meaning a wide nose, but. Basically, in conclusion, when it comes to what they're saying, is that the skulls at Kish represents the Eurafrican type, according to the men that I just named. And forgive me for my mispronunciation of these various uh, anthropologists, but I believe their names are, uh, they have uh, French names and, and uh, German names. But anyways, as I was saying, uh, most of the description of the skulls uh, from Kish basically represent that quote unquote Negroid skull type, according to everything that they said. So, continuing the report on the human remains found at Kish, it says there can be little hesitation in asserting this type to the people who have been called by Elliot Smith the brown race. 
These two types both belong to a group of humanity, which is classed as a single race by Hayden, who while who while apparently associating the brown race, including includes a further group, the Semites, of whom only one group, the Bedouin, here concerns us. In any case, up to the present among the bones from Kish, with one or two doubtful expressions, I have not found any defined examples of the people whom Hayden describes as Semites, whereas there are certain examples of the brown and the Mediterranean races, uh, the brown, the brown and the Euro-African races. On a morphological examination, it would appear that two branches of one stalk are to be found among the types represented by the skulls from Kish. And so let's look at Elliot Smith's understanding of the brown race, since they just mentioned that the well since they just mentioned that when it comes to these racial types that it fits Elliot Smith's description of the brown race and when it comes to Semites. So General Africa General History of Africa. It says particularly when we note once more that Mediterranean is not a synonym for white, Elliot Smith's brown or Mediterranean race being near the mark. Elliot Smith classes these proto-Egyptians as a branch of what he calls the brown race, which is the same as Sergi's brown, which is the same as Sergi's Mediterranean or Eurafrican race. The term brown is, uh, in this context, refers to skin color and is simply a euphemism for Negro. Interesting. So let's look at what Elliot Smith says from his own words. Um, this is from the ancient Egyptians and the origins of civilization. So it says, the Mediterranean and East African uh, laterals into the whole peninsula of Arabia and the shores of the Persian Gulf. In other words, Syria, Arabia, Mesopotamia, and Sumer were parts of the original domain of the brown race. So the brown race lived basically in Syria, Arabia, Mesopotamia, and Sumer. Basically the Middle East is where the brown race once resided. So there is a considerable mass of evidence to show that there was a very close resemblance between the proto-Egyptians and the Arabs. And that's very interesting because we read earlier in sources that pre-Dynastic Egyptians looks like Natufians and that it is believed that Natufians are the ancestors of Semites and Arabs. So it's very interesting how all this is starting to come together. Now the Proto-Egyptians, let's look at his description of Proto-Egyptians because that can give us an idea of what, what he means by the Arabs looking like Proto-Egyptians. So he says, the Proto-Egyptians, but there can be no doubt whatever that their dark hair was associated with dark eyes and a bronze complexion. Wall paintings and statues with black eyes and ruddy brown skin. Brown skins and irises of a black or dark brown color as the living populations of northeastern Africa, which must nearly resemble the proto-Egyptians in stature, have a coppery brown skin color. We must look upon the old Egyptian custom of representing men of their nationality with red skin. So I find this all to be very interesting how you have um, these uh, early Semitic populations looking brown or black in skin tone, which sort of fits along with what we read earlier about Shem's descendants looking brown and black. And we also have seemingly Hermetic peoples and Semitic peoples looking very similar, which again fits along with quotes again from various Hebrew, Christian, Arab, and Muslim writers who say that Shem and Ham descendants both look very similar. So this is very interesting. But con continuing with proto-Semites from you know anthropological or biological perspective, uh, this source contribution to the history of Iran says that in a private communication, he writes that this sequence is correct for Mesopotamia. As for 
example at Kish, the where the Mediterranean proto-Semite is under the Sumerian Alpine, he adds that the primitive Mediterranean type equals the Galas, etc. of Somaliland and Kenya colony, in which in turn equal the proto-Semites. So basically, uh, basically, you know, what the source is saying is that proto-Semites look like Galas from uh, Ethiopia or, or people from Kenya. And this is what early proto-Semites looked like. They would have looked basically African. It's very interesting. So here is Kish, by the way, just in case you want a visualization. Uh, Kish is in, the, is in modern day Iraq in Mesopotamia and uh, basically in the center part of Iraq or a little bit to the south center of Iraq. Um, one of the most ancient, oldest Semitic civilizations where we're getting these bodies from. And so now let's turn our attention to Mari, which is another old Semitic civilization. So Mari was an ancient Semitic city-state in modern-day Syria. It flourished as a trade center and hegemonic state between 2900 BC and 1759 BC. As a purposely built city, the existence of Mari was related to its position in the middle of the Euphrates of the Euphrates trade routes. This position made it an intermediary between Sumer in the south and the Ebalite kingdom in the Levant in the west. And so as you can see, there's a map of Mari. Uh, it encompassed a very wide uh, area. And on the bottom is a mural from Mari showing the what the people look like, how they depicted themselves. So let's uh, get a bit closer image. So as we can see, we see brown skin tones, dark brown skin tones, dark hair, and I would definitely assume dark eyes when it comes to the people of Mari. There's more murals from Mari. Here is one from the Palace of Mari in Mesopotamia, early 2nd millennium BC. Here is another mural from Mari in a royal palace. Uh, this one also goes back to the 2nd millennium BC. Dark hair, dark eyes, dark skin. Here is another fresco from Mari, Syria. And when I put them all together, I would say that these people would be a dark brown skinned people with black hair and dark eyes. And of course I have to the far uh, left hand side of the image people who are brown skinned, dark haired and dark eyes. I would say that this is sort of what they could have looked like in the flesh. So the depiction of proto-Semites from ancient Semitic civilizations in Mesopotamia based on the remains we found resemble I would say you know African or Ethiopian uh, peoples. In terms of uh, biology, what biologists said, um, they are your Afri brown your African or brown Mediterranean. But these terms and descriptions are synonymous with African features. Uh, and apparently proto-Semites in Mesopotamia had these features. Therefore, the Semites from Shem to Abraham could have looked, you know, African. So now let's look at Eber and Azurat. So the Book of Jubilees says that Eber married Azurat. Azurad was the daughter of Nimrod, and Nimrod was the son of Cush, and Cush was the son of Ham. This would mean that all Hebrews, including Abraham, would have Cushite African ancestry. Anciently, this could affect the phenotype of the early descendants of these Semites, because it's a Semitic and Hamitic admixture. According to Book of Jubilees, chapter 8, verse 9 through 10 says, Eber, and he took unto himself a wife, and her name was Azurad, the daughter of Nebrod. She saw she she bare him a son, and he called his name Peleg. The Book of Jubilees mentions the name of Nebrod, the Greek form of Nimrod, only as being the father of Azurad the wife of Eber, and mother of Peleg, who, by the way, is ancestor of Abraham. This, would, this account would thus make Nimrod an ancestor of Abraham, and hence all Hebrew 
peoples, or you know, all Hebrews. So, Genesis chapter 10, verse 8 says, Cush begot Nimrod, and he began to be a mighty one on the earth. So, when it comes to Cush, just want to make a, a quick uh, disclaimer. Uh, Cush, in my view, would be the proto nilotic and the Nilo Saharan people. Cush would have settled the Sudan region, and uh, this would be where the this would be who the Cushites would be in the uh, Hebrew sense, both for a young earth and an old earth. I believe this. So let me just quickly break down uh, the Cushites from son of Ham. So a proto nilotic unity separate from an earlier undifferentiated Eastern Sudanic unity is assumed to have emerged by the third millennium BC. The Eastern Sudanic unity must have been considerably earlier still, perhaps around the 5th millennium BC. The original locus of the early Nilotic speakers was presumably east of the Nile in what is now South Sudan. The Proto-Nilots of the 3rd millennium BC were pastoralists, while their neighbors, the Proto-Central Sudanic peoples, were mostly agriculturalists. Nilotic people practice an mixed economy of cattle, pastoralism, fishing, and seed cultivation. Genetics and linguistic studies have demonstrated that Nubian people in northern Sudan and southern Egypt are an admixed group that started off as a population closely related to a Nilotic people. Nubians are, cons Nubians are considered to be the descendants of the early inhabitants of the Nile Valley who later formed the Kingdom of Kush, which included Kerma and Moro, and the medieval Christian kingdoms of Mercuria, Nobotia, and Albade. These studies suggest that the populations closely related to Nilotic people long inhabited the Nile Valley as far as southern Egypt and antiquity. So those will be your Kushites from a biblical uh, perspective. And uh, Nilots, just give you a, a description of what they look like. A specialized African type native to the swamps and savannas of the Upper Nile region in southern Sudan and adjacent countries with their black skin. They, they belong to the darkest people on earth. Heads long, facial features coarse, with a rather with a rather wide nose, full lips, and kinky hair, Nilots seem to be a relatively old group that might have expanded further east into Ethiopia during historic times. And typically, these Sudanic people, these Sudanese people, these Nilotic peoples, their Y DNA is typically haplogroup A, which is still seen in the Sudan and various parts of Africa as well, as you can see below on the image. So, a, a, a woman, Azura, will be coming from this type of people, the Nilotic, Sudanic, uh, Nilo-Saharan type of people. And so we see this union between Eber, a Shemite, and Azura, a Hamite, coming into the lineage of Abraham. Basically, Abraham descending from this, line, this mixed lineage of Shemitic Eber and Hamitic Azura. They'll have... Cushetic African ancestry. Phenotypically, the people from Eber to Abraham could have looked somewhat African due to their admixture of African ancestry from their Cushetic Hamitic paternal or maternal lineage. So Abraham could have also looked like the Joktonite Arabians. So let's look at the uh, let's get into the Joktonite. So Joktonite Arabians would technically be the most ancient slash closest relatives to Abraham. Joktan was the son of Eber and the brother of Peleg. This makes Joktan and his descendants closely related ethnically to Abraham, uh, to Abraham, you know, ethnically. Therefore, uh, genetic, genetically speaking, uh, indigenous Arabians have the highest amount of Natufian ancestry. Joktanites are considered to be pure Arabians. A great example of Joktonites that Abraham could resemble are the Sabaeans. So just to do a, a quick uh, recap on Joktan. Joktan, Kwaktan, Koktan. Joktan's descendants are called Joktonites. There is an Arab tradition that Joktan was the 
ancestor slash progenitor of all the pure Arabian tribes of Central and Southern Arabia. ATS Bible Dictionary, Joktan, son of Eber, and he and by him connected with the Hebrews and other Shemitic families. He is believed to be the Koktan or Yaktan, to whom Arabian writers trace their purest and most ancient genealogies. Easton's Bible Dictionary, there is an Arab tradition that Joktan, Koktan, was the progenitor of all the purest tribes of Central and Southern Arabia. So here's just a visualization of the lineage. So we have Eber, and his sons are Peleg, whom Abraham would descend from, and eventually the Israelites. And then he has another son named Joktan, and these will be your Joktanites, and here are his sons. Famous people such as Sheba, Ophir, and Havilah. And these Joktanites would be the most ancient relatives to Abraham that we can glean from. And of course, the closest. So, he's, so Joktanites would be a good example of how Abraham could look. So let's get into the genetics of it. Um, this is from the genomic history of the Middle East. It says Arabians and Bedouins are positioned close to ancient Levantines, which would include your Israelites. Arabia has higher African and Natufian-like ancestries. In addition, our models suggest that Arabians could have derived their ancestry from Natufian-like local hunter-gatherer populations instead of Levantine farmers. So here is the Natufian genome, and uh, basically people such as Bedouins and Saudis have very high amounts of uh, Natufian, as well as people in quote tar, and as well as people in Yemen. They have a high amount of uh, Natufian ancestry. So this paper uh, also deals with it. It says, pro it's titled, Projecting Ancient Ancestry in Modern Day Arabians and Iranians, a key role of the past exposed Arabo Persian Gulf on human migrations. So it says, modern Saudi Arabian and Yemeni samples clustered tightly with a lower left quadrant overlapping with the three Natufian samples and were close to the Levant PPNB, pre pottery Neolithic B, and PPNC, pre pottery Neolithic C and Levant Bronze Age samples. So modern Saudi Arabians and Yemenis are close to Natufians. It says two thirds of the West Arab, Arab Persian populations have ancestry shared with the Natufian typical of the Levant. So very interesting. So here is uh, the percentage. Uh, here is Yemen and Saudi Arabia. As you can see here in highlighted in yellow, but actually in red. They have high amounts of Natufian. And uh, here's a map showing it. Uh, the Natufian ancestry in Arabia is typically near the uh, Red Sea in Yemen and uh, the western part of uh, of Arabia. And uh, they have the highest amounts. Here's the F. It's talking about F group. And they have high amounts of Natufian. So this goes right back to what Sir Arthur Keith said. He said, they may have been, they, the Natufians, may have been the ancestors of the Arabs or Semites of biblical times, in Sir Arthur Keith's opinion. And genetically speaking, this is actually true. Natufians would be the ancestors of Arabs and, uh, and Semites. So it's interesting how old anthropologists only using bones were able to determine this, and now with DNA were able to confirm this. It's fascinating. And of course, when it comes to the Natufian phenotype, what did Natufians look like? It is a further surprise that the Epipaleolithic Natufian of Israel, from whom the Neolithic realm was assumed to arise, has a clear link to Sub-Saharan Africa. And of course, there is a Natufian reconstruction. So that's how ancient proto-Semites or pre-proto-Semites could have looked. So now let's actually look a little bit deeper into the uh, original Arabian population. So this is from a book, The Arabs, by Bertram Thomas. He says, The original inhabitants of Arabia, then, according to Sir Arthur Keith, one of the world's greatest living anthropologists, who, had, who has made a study of Arab skeletal remains, ancient and modern, 
were not the familiar Arabs of our own time, but a much more darker people. A proto-Negroid belt of mankind stretched across the ancient world from Africa to Malay, giving rise to the Hamitic peoples of Africa, to the Dravidian peoples of India, and to the intermediate dark people inhabiting the Arabian Peninsula. It's very interesting. This is from the Negro in the New World. It says, it is quite conceivable that the Great Peninsula of Arabia was once populated, as far as its natural conditions allowed, by a primitive Negro stock. So, m many sources are pointing to the idea of a proto-Negroid or primitive Negroid looking people in old Arabia. This is from Henry Fields. It's, he says, uh, among these Negroid features which may be counted normal in Arabs are the full, rather averted lips, shortness and wide, width, widest of nose, certain blanks in the beards, bearded areas of the face, between the lower lip and chin and the on the cheeks, large, lascivious, razel like eyes, and dark brown complexion. That's the key thing, a dark brown complexion and a tendency for the hair to grow in ringlets. And here's the most interesting thing from Henry Field. He says, although the Arab of today is sharply di differentiated from the Negro of Africa, yet there must have been a time when both were represented by a single ancestral stock. In no other way can, can, the, uh, pre can the prevalence of certain Negroid features be accounted for in the natives of Arabia. So basically saying that there must have been a time when both, seemingly like both the, the Negro and the Arabian was was like one type of population or descend from one type of ancestral population, but they split. And I think that's very interesting. And of course, on the left of your screen, you see uh, uh, Arabs or Arabians uh, by uh, uh, photos taken of them back in the 1930s by Br uh, Br Brian Thompson, uh, Thomas. Uh, this is in the uh, Arabia Felix near the Hejaz, so it's very interesting. And of course, when it comes to the Encyclopedia Britannia, uh, the ninth edition, it says that regarding the, ori the origin of the Arab race, a third is the name Hamir or Dusky, a circumstance pointing like the former to African origin. The fourth is the Homeric language, the uh, the Homeric language, or African in character, often in identity. Indeed, the dialect commonly used along the southeastern coast hardly differs from that used by the Somali Africans on the on the opposite shore. The pure Arabs, like the Jacobites, differ from that of the north. Sixthly, the pre-Islamic institution of Yemen and its allied provinces, its monarchies, courts, armies, and serf bears a marked resemblance to the historical Afro-Egyptian type, even to Abyssinians, which are East Africans. Uh, seventhly, their physical confirmation of the pure-blooded Arab inhabitants of Yemen, Hadronite, and Oman. Other uh, other particulars point in a African rather than an Asiatic direction. Lastly, the extreme fallacy of marriage, which exhibits in all cases, which ex which exists in all cases of the Southern Arabs with the African races, the felduc the felducity of such unions and the slightless in the slightness of even absence of any caste feeling between the dusky, pure Arab and the still darker native of modern Africa may be regarded as pointing in the direction of a common of a com of a unity of a of a community of origin. So basically what he's saying is sort of similar to what Henry said is that you know the peoples like the Abyssinians of East Africa and the Arabians on the other side of the Red Sea, the Southern Arabians seem to have a similar joint 
union or joint origin. And that seems to be the case when you look at the Joktonites. Check out my video on Sheba, son of Joktan, that Joktonites actually did go into the land of East Africa. But continuing, it's, uh, the continuing more understanding of these Arabians, Henry Field in his Ancient and Modern Humans, his book, Ancient and Modern Man in Southwestern Asia says, Dravidian and Arab have in them an inheritance of a common stock, an inheritance which has been retained more completely by the natives of India than by the people of Arabia. So basically saying that even the Dravidians and the Arabs seem to, you know, in their phenotype, have a common link. And on the uh, right hand side of my screen at the top are, are Dravidians, uh, ancient Indian types. And so, Mar uh, Marshall and Vaughn uh, Eiffel's Eiffel remarkable insight has the support of contemporary ethnogeography, ethno, uh, ethno ethnology, and modern genetic research. Sir Arthur Keith and Dr. Wilton Maran Corgian, in their discussion of the, by the, by the way, the book is called. The racial characteristic of the southern Arabs, they say the Arabian Peninsula was at one time occupied by a people intermediate to the Somalis on the one hand and to the Dravidian peoples of India on the other. So basically, they're saying that the original Arabian population was something in between a Somali and a Dravidian. And on the bottom of the screen, on the left hand, right hand side of the screen, is a Somali. And so Basically, like I said, they're saying that the original Arabian population was looking like a Dravidian or a Somali, something like a mix of the two, which is very interesting. And so this is a quote dealing with the Joktanites, and it says, The people of Defar are of the Joktan, or the Quoctan tribe, the sons of Joktan, mentioned in Genesis. They are of Hametic, or African, rather than Arab types. And there to the right-hand side of my screen is a chief from Defar. So that's what they're saying that Jock tonight's look like. And I find this all to be very interesting how the Chaldeans, the Elamites, the Jock tonight's, the Arabs, they're all being referred to as looking like Hamites or Africans, uh, even when it comes to Proto-Semites from those earlier uh, quotes that I read with the Euro-African. All of these people are saying that they look like Hamites and Africans. And... Furthermore, this fits perfectly with what those quotes said about those quotes from Hebrews and Arabs and Christians and Persians who say Shem descendants are brown and black and how Shem's descendants look like Hamites. Uh, it, it all just sort of comes together perfectly. So let's deal a little bit more with the Jock tonight because I'm not done. This is from Prehistoric Nations by John D. Baldwin. It says in the traditions in the traditions, Saba described as a descendant of Cocton, is the next personage who represents an important historical epoch. The legends connect him with the southern, with the southwestern quarter of the peninsula and with a kingdom that seems to have included Yemen, Hadronaut, and Hejaz, and other districts. Hamir, a descendant of Saba, is another royal personage to whom special but unexplained historical importance is attached. So, this is from African uh, presence in early Asia. It says the Encyclopedia Britannia gives a description of the physical qualities of the original Arabs. And it says, who will be Joktonites. And it says, the, in the inhabitants of Yemen, Hadronaut, Oman, and the adjacent districts in the shape uh, of the heat color Length, the slenderness of the bones and scantiness of the hair point to an African origin. They claimed descent from Cocton. These Yemenite kings, descendants of Cocton and Hamir the Dusky, a, na a name denoting African origin. The general characteristics of the institutions of Yemen bore considerable resemblance to the neighboring ones of the Nile Valley. So basically, they're saying that, you know, these people who descend from the legendary Joktun or Yoktun or Kwaktun, they look like 
or seemingly have an African origin and they look like people of the Nile Valley. And this quote right here, this is early of the nations of the southeast, early Israel and the surrounding nations by Archbeld Skirsi says, the people of Sheba belong to the South Arabian stock. In both blood and language, they differ considerably from the Semites of the north. Physically, they bore some resemblance to the Egyptians, and it is and it has been suggested that the Egyptians were originally immigrants from their shores. Some of them crossed the Red Sea and founded colonies in Africa, in the modern Abyssinia, where they built cities and introduced the culture of their former homes. Like the Egyptians, the Babylonians, they were a literate people. Their inscriptions are still scattered thickly along the ruins of their towns, written in the letters of the alphabet, which is usually termed Phoenician. So basically, uh, from this quote, the people of Sheba, who descend from the southern Arabians, which will be your Joktonites, they look like Egyptians, according to the source, which of course is very interesting. Furthermore, they say that these peoples migrated even into modern-day Abyssinia, which fits along with your Ethiosemitic people that I talked about in my video, Sheba son of Joktan. And there to the right hand side of your screen is ancient depictions of Egyptians. Basically, these people would have been dark brown skinned, black haired, dark eyed. And of course, the description of, you know, Joktanites looking like Egyptians fits along with what Elliot Smith said uh, his, in his book, The Ancient Egyptians and the Origin of Civilization. There is a considerable mass of evidence to show that there was a close resemblance between the proto-Egyptians and the Arabs. So it's funny how all these books sort of just follow along. Um, and of course, when it comes to the proto-Egyptians, they were dark haired, uh, with associate, uh, which was associated with dark eyes and a bronze complexion. They had black eyes and a ruddy brown skin. Uh, they had brown irises, brown skin. Uh, the iris was black and dark brown, and they looked like people of Northeast Africa. Uh, the Proto-Egyptians had a coppery brown skin color. You know, they always depict themselves with a red skin. So this is basically what we're getting at when it comes to uh, these uh, ancient original Arab types. And of course, when it comes to what Elliot Smith said about the Proto-Egyptians calling them the brown race the brown race is associated with quote unquote you know a negroid type of people so and of course the your african as well is associated with the negro people of africa or closer closely related to the negro people of africa so it's all following along down a same trajectory which is these people are dark skinned <laughs> these ancient people are dark skinned so this quote dealing with Southern Arabians, the people of Arabia belong to two distinct and apparently quite different races. The Arabs of South, Southern South Arabia are smaller, darker, and coarser featured, and nearly beardless. All authorities agree that the Southern Ar Arabs are nearly related by origin to the Abyssinians, who are your Ethiosemites. And so, Abyssinians are Habasha peoples, and they are a uh, Semitic language-speaking peoples who mainly, uh, who mainly, you know, live and reside in the highlands of Ethiopia and Eritrea. And uh, people in the diasporic community uh, typically have adopted the name uh, Habashas, all, referring to all peoples of you know Eritrean and Ethiopian origin. And by the way, those are images uh, to the right hand side of your screen is uh, depictions or, you know, well, I, should I say an actual image of uh, Habesha people. So that's how Joktonites could have looked and early Semites for that matter. But now let's read uh, more books dealing with Southern Arabians. This is uh, racial types from South Arabia. It says racial affinities of the South Arab lie in Northeast Africa. A Negroid strain occurs in the belt from Africa through South Arabia to Malaysia, uh, including the Dravidians of southern India. So again, 
you're seeing that these Southern Arabians, these Joktonites, they looking like Africans. And so now let's look at some Sabaean statues. There are Sabaean statues, you know, two, two male statues. Look at their features, look at their hair. And here is a Sabaean statue right next to an Ethiopian. And when I look at the features, they look pretty much the same. And here's more depictions of a Sabaean with a Ethiopian or Abyssinian. And here's more. And I and I think that I will agree with these writers who say that Ethiopians are descendants of these Sabaeans. And this is how Sabaeans could have looked. They basically would have looked like your Ethiopians uh, of today. Because the features just match perfectly, even when it comes to the women uh, and the hairstyles and, of course, the features of the face. So here is, you know, here's just a good example of what these people look like. Sabaeans, Ethiopians, Abyssinians, Havisha, you know, all one and the same. So Abraham could have looked like. Joktonite Arabians and Joktonite Arabians looked like Africans, specifically Ethiopic. So Abraham could have looked Ethiopic. Bedouins are another good example or another good group that Abraham could have looked like. Bedouins, like Arabians, are another ancient indigenous population to the Middle East. Like the Arabians, their closest ancestors are the Natufians. And now, furthermore, we can find ancient depictions of uh, Bedouins from Syria, uh, where Abraham came from. And Abraham, in a sense, is kind of like a Bedouin because he's a bit nomadic in parts of the scriptures where he's always, you know, where he's wandering from, from Ur to, to the land of Canaan. He kind of becomes like a Bedouin in a sense. But according to the genomic history of the Middle East, Arabians and Bedouins and Bedouins and Bedouins are positioned close to the ancient Levantines, which would be your Israelites. It is a further surprise that the Epipaleolithic Natufian of Israel, from whom the Neolithic realm was assumed to arise, has a clear link to Sub-Saharan Africa. So Bedouins are connected to Natufians. And so when it comes to Bedouins, historically the indigenous tribal groups or tribal peoples of the Middle East called the Bedouins or Bedouari have often excluded or have often been excluded or overlooked compared to the settled populations within the Levant region. And as you can see at the top is, you know, Bedouin boys, two Bedouins, quite dark skinned. And, you know, here is a Bedouin head from Syria. I uh, just want to re-show you that, you know, when it comes to the Bedouins of ancient times, they, they too are dark skinned. Two Bedouins depicted by Egyptians. And these Bedouins are situated in Syria. And here are 18th, 18th century uh, drawings uh, of Bedouins. This is a, a, a young Bedouin girl, uh, a nomadic Bedouin pastoralist uh, in the Negev, uh, the Sinai Negev, Syria. And uh, their, their features are, to say the least, interesting when it comes to the hair and the face and the skin tone. And here are pictures, old pictures of Bedouins. Uh, again, these are clearly a dark-skinned people. And here are more depictions of Bedouins, but these images are a little bit more colorized. And as you can see, they are still quite dark-skinned. These are Bedouins in Jerusalem, as a matter of fact, in Israel. And here is just more Bedouins. This is from the Jordan, uh, which is a neighbor to the to Israel. You know, it's in the Levant region. And Bedouin girl and a Bedouin camel uh, herder. And here is Bedouins from Oman, specifically. This is another part, but this is in Arabia. And so the Al-Rashid uh, southern tribe uh, well, the Al Rashid is a Hadwi or Bedouin southern tribe and seems to have been part of the Bart Karithi tribe in the past. Forgive me for my mispronunciations for the last words and the words coming up. The Washed were among the most isolated of the tribes in Oman, living in the far reaches of Dufar. And Dufar, by the way, was what 
the early writer said that Jock Tonight's look like. It says, uh, with little interaction with the out with the outside world until the second half of the 20th century, they are still considered to be one of the few pure Bedouins. So that's interesting. So people in this region, the Al Rashid Bedouin tribe, are considered pure Bedouins. So let's look at what these people look like. So here are Bedouins of that type. Uh, Bedouin Bats uh, Kathri or the Bedouin Rashid, as they said right here, the Al Rashid or the Bats uh, Kathri, uh, Bat Kathri, Bedouin Rashid. So, this is what they looked like right here. This was uh, images taken in the 1940s, and let's get a closer image. So, this is uh, what these Bedouins, these quote unquote, you know, pure Bedouins look like. And again, we're dealing with a very dark skinned people and dark haired people. And here is the Rashid tribe, the uh, Rashid Rashidia tribe, as they said earlier. And again, we're dealing with people who are quite dark skinned, medium brown to, uh, you know, medium brown to very dark brown. Al Rashid, this is a family of them. Here is a Rashidi boy, brown skin, brown eyes brown hair or you know dark hair here is a rashid man bedouin here is a, a um rashid in saudi arabia at a campbell market uh yeah and here is again in a campbell market in saudi arabia man or a rashid on a camel here is rashid men having <laughs> having breakfast and uh, as you can see they're Quite dark skinned Bedouin people. And here are two Rashid people having a gentleman's disagreement, I would say. And uh, that's, uh, you know, a Rashid man. So, just a closer image. So, Abraham could have looked, uh, could have looked Bedouin. Uh, Bedouins are typically dark skinned, dark haired, and dark eyed. Abraham likely had dark brown skin, dark hair, and dark eyes. And Basically, I would say, you know, that's what, you know, Abraham could have really looked like. So now let's look at the, the Greek and the skin tone map. There seems to have always been an understanding that the Middle East had dark skinned inhabitants. The Greeks recorded this. Furthermore, if we look at indigenous skin tone maps of the world, you can clearly see what the complexion of people would be based on UV maps. So this is from Ethiopia and the Origin of Civilization by John by John G. Jackson. And it says in ancient times Ethiopia extended over vast domains in both Africa and Asia. It seems certain, declares Sir E. A. William Bugin, uh, Bugin that classical historians and geographers called the whole region from India to Ethiopia to from India to Egypt, both countries inclusive by the name of Ethiopia, and in consequence, they regarded all the dark-skinned and black peoples who inhabited as Ethiopians. Mention is made of Eastern and Western Ethiopians, and it is uh, probable that the Eastern Easterners were Asiatics and the Westerners Africans. In addition, uh, Bulgin notes that Homer and Herodotus call all the peoples of Sudan, Egypt, Arabia, Palestine, and Western Asia, and India, Ethiopians. Another classical historian who wrote about the Ethiopians was Strabo, from whom we note the from whom we no, we quote the following I assert that the ancient Greeks, in the same way as they classified all the northern tr nations with which they were familiar as Scythians, etc., so I affirm they designated as Ethiopians the whole of the southern countries towards the ocean. Eodorus says that the Egyptians were considered as occupying all the southern coasts of both Asia and Africa, and adds that that this is an ancient opinion of the Greeks. 
And so this is from A History of Ethiopia, Volume 1, Nubia and uh, Abyssinia, E.A. Williams of um, Budgel. And he says, though the country of Ethiopia is frequently mentioned by classical writers, Homer, Herodotus, Strabo, Diodorus, uh, um, Pelopi, and others, Homer uh, speaks in the Odyssey, the Ethiopians utter most of mankind. These eastward uh, statutes, those towards the west. Uh, this extract, this extraction, this these extracts only show that Homer thought that they were eastern and western Ethiopians. From these various statements, we may conclude that Homer and Herodotus called all the peoples of the Sudan. Egypt, Arabia, Palestine, and Western Asia, and India, Ethiopians. Homer invented the name Ethiopia and Ethiopians. As Herodotus, Strabo, and, Pen and Pelopi uh, connect Ethiopia with Egypt. And there is no doubt that the earliest classical writers considered to, uh, that the earliest classical writers considered to be Ethiopians. All the peoples who were swarthy or brown-skinned or black-skinned, including the Negroes, and the country in which they lived, whether the Sudan or Western Asia or India, to be Ethiopia. So basically, people from Africa to the Middle East to India were all called dark-skinned people. They were all called Ethiopians, which is basically dark-skinned. And uh, just to give you the, the Greek understanding of Ethiopia, it means to be burnt-faced, basically dark-skinned. The sin kissed these people the skin the, the uh, excuse me the sun kissed these people the sun uh you know it touched these people it made them dark because you know when you burn something uh, in fire like a piece of paper or wood it turns dark it turns to ash so that's what they mean when when someone's an ethiopian that they're a burnt face person and so just to give you a quick understanding of ethiopid Ethiopians are characterized by very dark skin with a reddish tint, tightly curly hair, narrow, high nose, a, a tall, slender stature, and long heads and face, marked, uh, marked uh, uh, chin, thick lips. Beside, uh, besides affinity to other sub-Saharan Africans, they are linked to early Caucasoids who, uh, who partially left and migrated back to Africa. So. That's the Ethiopian phenotype, Ethiopian phenotype. So here is a skin tone map dealing with UV ra radiation and what indigenous peoples would have looked like, you know, had migration not occurred and things like that. This is what uh, the natural skin tones of people would be. And um, this is, a, here's a UV understanding when it comes to uh, the heat of the world and the coldness of the world. As you can see where it is red, uh, well, purple, blue, red, and yellow. That's where people will be kind of kind of dark skinned and brown. And as we can see, it kind of overlaps with the Middle East. Indigenous peoples of the Middle East would have ranged from a light brown to a medium brown to a black complexion. Kind of like what most of these quotes have been saying. And basically, when it comes to type 4, Brown skin uh, rarely burns with sun exposure that, you know, fits with the Middle East. And it's common in the in the people of the Mediterranean descent. Now, when it comes to dark brown skin, very rarely burns with sun exposure, common in the people of the Middle Eastern descent. And I agree with the basically type 4, type A, and type 6 being that Mediterranean, that brown Mediterranean, or brown Euro-African, or brown Middle Eastern type, which fits along with the skin tone map and fits along with this understanding, you know, type 4, light brown to tan skin, dark hair and eyes, type 5, uh, dark skin, dark eyes, dark hair, and then type 6, very dark skin, dark eyes, and dark hair. All of this would be your ancient Middle Eastern types from Shem, specifically. And basically, when it comes to the descendants of Shem, the early Semitic inhabitants, this single image basically summarizes my thoughts when it comes to the proto-Semites and the descendants of Shem, 
ranging from uh, basically light brown skin tones to medium brown skin tones to dark brown skin tones and to even black skin tones because obviously you can have black skin tones in the Middle East. So this is what the early descendants of Shem would look like having various facial features, uh, by the way, as well, especially as time goes on and depending on who you mix with. So that's are the, these are the early descendants of Shem. And here's the global map of indigenous skin tones, what the skin tones of Shemites would have looked like in the earliest of days. So therefore, since the descendants of Shem to Abraham live in the general region of the Middle East, I would say that they could fit into the black and brown category of people recorded by the Greeks. And we can clearly see this when we look at UV indigenous skin tone maps. So, Shem to Abraham phenotype. To conclude, what would the Semites from Shem to Abraham look like? From everything we covered, one, the description of Shem's descendants are black and brown. Two, description of Natufians, Negroid phenotype. Three, description of proto-Semites, Negroid or Ethiopic phenotype. Four, Eber and Azurad, all Hebrews have Cushite, Hamite ancestry. Five, Syrians and Arameans are depicted and described as black, east of Armenus. Six, Chaldeans and Elamites, described as Negroid or Ethiopid. Seven, Chaldeans, described as Cushetic slash Hamitic looking. Six, Joktanite Arabians, described as Cushetic and Hamitic looking. Nine, Proto-Arabians, described as Proto-Negroid or Primitive Negroid looking. Ten, uh, Bedouins, phenotypically black to brown skinned when it comes to Middle Easterners. And 11, Greeks said that peoples of the Middle East looked like Ethiopians and 12 UV maps show that peoples, indigenous peoples would have looked brown and black. I didn't add, I didn't add 11 to 12, but went ahead and said it. Ba uh, based on all of this from uh, a young earth perspective and technically, Technically, you can even use this for an older perspective, but based on a younger perspective, I would say that proto-Semites from Shem going down the line to Abraham from the genealogy would have looked somewhat African, but also Arabian. Uh, but with a visual representation of what Semites and what Abraham could have looked like using everything we covered, here, here's basically the summary. This is how... Um, Abraham and early Semites could have looked. Everything on one nice image. We have the Chaldeans, the people of Mari, Syria, the black Syrians or Arameans, the Elamites, the uh, black Bedouins of Syria, and the um, Sabaeans and Abyssinians. Everything on one image. So this is how I would say, you know, early Semites how I would say Abraham could have looked like based on everything we covered, just dealing with ancient populations alone. Um, this is a, 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 the best example that I can uh, provide. So, as stated before, I would say proto-Semites from Shem going down to Abraham from the genealogy would look somewhat African, but also Arabian. After all, early Asiatics looked African, and early Semites were believed to be Africans. Uh, early West Asians resemble Africans. Sources at the top. A uh, comparison of craniofacial features of major human groups. And here is from a conversation with Christopher Eretz. After all, the early Semites were just a few Africans arriving to find a lot of other people already in the area. And as we know, Shem, he is the ancestor of Semitic peoples, and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are descendants of Shem. So we made it to the end of the video. Uh, the phenotype of proto-Semites from a young earth perspective. And don't forget to like, share, subscribe, click the bell, and leave a comment for any questions you might have. And um, don't forget to follow any of my social media apps.
as mentioned in the beginning of the video. And with all that out of the way, have a great day and shalom.